the, that's a lot, you may think it's a lot. Uh, in the days when doctors were giants, we used to work <laughs> 120 hours a week. And you know why? Because a disease does not stay as it presents itself in the emergency room. It changes hour by hour by hour by hour. And during your training years, you must just watch that disease develop. You've got to watch it evolve to know exactly how to treat it. And you've got to watch it evolve so you understand the patient who has it and you've got to watch it evolve so you can give proper treatment. Doctors have, young doctors have become what one of my colleagues calls shift workers. So there's very little continuity of care. Uh, to add to that, there are 30,000 doctors in this country who are called hospitalists. So when you're admitted to a hospital, your doctor who has known you and your value system and what you want at the end of life can't take care of you you are assigned to a hospitalist who doesn't know you. Uh, one of my friends who is a senior Yale faculty member uh, fell down, uh, got a concussion, slashed the side of his face open, broke a facial bone, and when I visited him on the third day, he had been seen by somewhere between five and seven doctors, not his own, and he didn't know the name of a single one of them. So what about patients who are dying? What about patients for whom the most valuable thing a doctor can give is understanding and compassion? By knowing their values, by knowing their religious beliefs, by knowing the way they relate to their families, help them make decisions at the end of life. It doesn't anymore exist. Young doctors are taught to treat by algorithms now. The patient has this symptom, he gets this diagnostic test. If it's positive, he gets this diagnostic test. If that's positive, he gets this therapy. The notion of judgment, the notion of individualization, the notion of putting hands on a belly. Watch television. Every doctor you see examining a patient with a stethoscope examines through the shirt. Just watch, they never lift up the shirt to put the stethoscope on the skin. I want to tell you a little story. I'm, I'm taking much too much time, but I don't care and I hope you don't care. So I'll just continue. I want to tell you this historical story. The year is 1860 and we're in Paris and it's, you know, 20, 30 years after the French Revolution, 16 and 11, okay, 27 years after the French Revolution, and you know what happened, among other things, every young person who wanted to make their fortune came to Paris. Uh, you've all seen La Boheme, of course, that took place later in the 19th century, but that's the way it was, you know, starving young men and women living in garrets, trying to make a way in the world. The French hospitals, the Paris hospitals were filled with patients with all kinds of infectious disease, malnutrition, who knows what. At one point, uh, the Hotel Dieu, which was the biggest hospital in Paris, used to put five patients in a bed. You'd wake up in the morning and the fellow next to you was dead. This was a very common thing. There, were lot, there was lots of tuberculosis, lots of chest disease. So year is 1860. The way you listen to a chest is to put your ear on it. So here's this young doctor whose name is Rene Teofil Hyacinth Lenek, and he's about five feet one inch tall, very shy guy. Bad enough, his middle name is Hyacinth. He, he's scared silly of women. He's never had a date in his life. He's about 35 years old. Later, he marries, he gets married, but he marries his housekeeper. But he makes up for it because she gets pregnant, you know, within three months of marriage. But in any event, he's not married yet, and he's making rounds because he's the chief of the chest service at this little hospital on the outskirts of Paris. And all of the patients are pretty filthy because, you know, in those days, the French would have a, be bathed when they were born, have a bath the night before they got married, and would bathe before they were buried. Those of you who've recently been on the Paris Metro might think it's still that way. <laughs> but in any event, in any event, they smelt bad that, you know, to, to put your ear on their chest was difficult under any circumstances, but he was faced with a buxom, very attractive, 
and very flirtatious young woman, and he didn't know what to do. He got very nervous, and he canceled the rounds. His retina was behind him, and he went home. To go home, he had to walk through the courtyard of the Louvre, that, which at that time was a palace. And there were a bunch of kids playing a game that he used to play when he was small. It was a great big lawn, two by four, about 10 feet long. And one kid would scratch a signal, prearranged signal, on one end, and another kid would listen and try to interpret the signal. And he's watching these kids. And he says, Sacre bleu, or whatever it was the Frenchman said in those days. He hails a passing cab, a cabriolet, actually, goes back to the hospital, rolls up a notebook, and there's this same young woman. And he puts that notebook, his ear to one end, the other end is under her left breast. And he hears the sounds he would have heard if he put his ear on. And he invents the stethoscope. That's Rene Lenec inventing the stethoscope. Later, the shape changed, whatever. Uh, and now, if you watch House, you know, again, it's probably through an overcoat by, by now. <laughs> But when that stethoscope was invented, it was about a foot long. You could divide it in two and put it in your hat band. There was a lot of controversy about it. One of the controversies was some people understood the metaphor. They understood the symbolism. And they were actually writing, this is the first thing we've ever had in medicine that physically separates us from patients. And you watch this, it's going to change. We will be separated from patients. And lo and behold, that is what has happened with modern technology. That's essentially it. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse. A new generation of doctors is being raised under such constraints, suffocated by the demands being made of them, the demands for objectivity, the demands for for measurement, the demands for calculation. We live today in the age of the image, as you well know, the age of the laboratory, the age of cost constraints, empathy, autonomy, caring, simple, unhurried kindness is not measurable, and it is lost. And it is lost because these things are encumbrances to quantifiable efficiency. And so where is hope? Where is hope for the dying who have no hope of avoiding their own deaths? What sort of psychological, spiritual, moral hope can they look to? Well, in the book How We Die, I have a list of ways in which hope can be shared with people who are dying. But since that book came out, I read Disturbing the Peace by Vaclav Havel. These were interviews made shortly after he came out of prison. And he wrote a wonderful thing about hope that applies specifically to the case at the end of life. And, and I want to read it to you as he wrote it in his book. Hope is not prognostication. It's not prediction. It's an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart, it transcends the world that is immediately experienced and it's anchored somewhere beyond its horizons. Hope, in this deep and powerful sense, is not the same as joy that things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for success, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good, not because it stands a chance to succeed. The more unpropitious the situation in which we demonstrate hope, the deeper that hope is. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. In short, I think that the deepest, most important form of hope, the only one that can keep us above water and urge us to good works, and the only true source of the breathtaking dimension of the human spirit in its efforts is something we get, as it were, from elsewhere. From elsewhere. There is hope for the dying, I believe, in Havel's words. This is an extra dimension of the human spirit. And it has to do with our sense of the immortality and the sense of the memory of what we are and of what we stood for and of our values to those we leave behind us. 
Our aim is to avoid the inevitability of the kind of death that's forced on us still in modern hospitals, even though there are economic, biotechnological forces that would have it otherwise. We must resist. Sometimes we must resist forcefully. And I have a few suggestions. And one of these came up at this fascinating dinner that several of us had a few hours ago. The word for funeral in the Hebrew is leviah, which means, it's a verb actually, to accompany. And the reason one accompanies at a funeral, the way it works out, is a hearse will pull up. Six friends of the departed will carry the coffin to the gravesite, a distance perhaps sometimes as long as a fifth of a mile. That is the accompaniment. My argument is that when it becomes clear that there's death on the horizon, that is when we, as physicians, as nurses, as clergy, as aid workers, should begin to accompany the dying to their last moments. That is when we should begin the discussions about what the end of life for that individual, that unique individual, must be. It cannot wait for the last two or three weeks or two or three days. You know, most hospice patients are admitted within three to four weeks of dying. They, the, some of them are admitted the night before. Uh, there is no levia. There is no accompaniment. There is no chance for people who are taking care of that during those last few moments to get to know them at all, to know their value systems or their family value system. So that's one thing that we must think about doing. We must restore the pastoral aspects of medicine. Those Hippocratic values that tell us that all of our patients are our moral and not just professional responsibility. Again, as I said earlier, that this is a calling. And that death itself obviously is not a disease and it should not be medicalized. There is a point when the function of the physician is as counselor, as pastor, in addition to the other obvious pastoral help that is coming along. Uh, we have to restore the pastoral aspects. We have to restore that Hippocratic philosophy. There's a wonderful quote in one of his books. It's called Ethics. Where love of mankind is, there is also love of the art. They called medicine the art, and they knew then that it was an art, and we should remember now that it is an art. We need far more family physicians than we have, and it is absolutely necessary to quantify medical income so that family physicians are not earning one-fifth to one-sixth what dermatologists are earning. You see, I have this thing about dermatologists. <laughs> <laughs> <Pretty clear. laughs> We need an up and down study of the American medical system, the American medical educational system, and it has to be done by a large group of people, and we must teach our medical students that they have to emphasize care as least as much as they emphasize cure. And it is incumbent on those who do the study, who do the study of American medicine, to recognize what the old Hippocratic physicians used as some of their values, including the value of predicting as long beforehand as one possibly can. To recognize when death is imminent or at least on the horizon, and at that point to recognize also that death is not a disease and that death is not a meta and dying is not a medical condition. And once that is realized and accepted, to continue and to increase the way they nurture the patient and nurture the family, and in this way to nurture ourselves because the real secret of healing lies in the nurture. Thank you very much. <laughs>